Welcome to our Compose Cast, where we discuss productivity, self hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac. And with me is my co host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I am doing very well. I'm uh, ready for today's show. I think we got a uh, good content lined up, so I'm ready to see where we where it goes and where we take it. Yeah, no, we got a we got a lot coming up. But personally, I, I just wanted to touch base with you. How how are you doing after COVID? You're going good. back to the gym and stuff, and yep, out the at the gym right now. So I'm doing well. Everything's honestly back to normal. Loving everything. I, I'm not running as much anymore, which is kind of nice. Back into lifting, so it's been good. Right. You doing all right over there with the uh, body weight stuff? Yep. Yep, it's uh it's fun. I was I was waiting to for my pre workout to kick in um by wrapping presents. So okay. I had to uh I had to I had to get that in last minute um as I'm about to take off tomorrow uh to, to Cleveland to go see my folks and spend Christmas with them. So okay. I'm assuming you, you said your parents are coming up? Family's coming up, yep. So I'll see them uh tomorrow, probably through the I'll say next few days here. Are you guys doing anything for New Year's? I'm supposed to go down with them, but I don't know. We're that's still being figured out. Did you ever end up getting a new car? I did. Yeah, I got a uh, truck there. Yeah, uh, I had a Tacoma there. Yeah. So, and I know you're driving a new car over there too. Oh well, we'll see how long that lasts. Why um, is that? There, there were a couple things that that I've discovered about the car that made me Uh-oh. make it expensive to keep. So, Uh-oh. I mean, right now I got a garage floor full of oil. Uh, that smells like gas. We'll see how bad, the, you know, if it's like a $500 repair or if it's like a $2,500 repair, yeah. you know, kind of yeah. kind of thing. So we'll we'll see how that pans out. Perils of buying a used car. To jump into it here, I had a another bit of Python goodness that was sprung upon me this last week. I figured I'd include it as well in our uh, quest to disprove the pseudocodeness of Python. <laughs> The article was actually from last year. Uh, it was making its way around the internet again. It's uh, the, the less known bits of the Python standard library. Last episode, I was able to branch out into stuff that I didn't know about F-strings. So I, I was very yeah. interested to, to find this and, and stuff that maybe I, I haven't been using as much as I could. W- one of the ones that I did take advantage of was pprint. Right? And I yeah, yeah. I typically have a common dot pi in whatever repo i have to house you know the functions that i use a lot uh, one of them is like eprint which prints out to standard error instead of standard out uh, so if i need to capture standard out i don't have to worry about logging stuff i can just print there but it's it's like this little esoteric you got to redirect to to dev standard error and i always forget how to do that so i just stick the the function in there and, and in call it from pi, inside yeah. of yeah inside of common dot pi um and and one of the other ones i i often use is uh, json print which will take a dictionary or some other kind of json serializable data and it will dump it so that it's human readable it's easy to read when i'm when i'm trying to look at stuff yeah p print's a good one um especially i, I think you can use it right to print json and uh objects and gen- serialized objects right yes it's short for pretty print the thing that I don't understand why it's not just in the core library, why you have to actually import it. I mean, Python, as we know, is batteries included, so it's there in all Python installations, but you do have to import pprint. If you just do that, it's pprint.pprint because the function name is pprint and the library name is pprint. Uh, love when people do that. Daytime, again, daytime.daytime. I, I love more typing, guys. Keep <laughs> Keep bringing that at me. It, it is a good built-in replacement for w- those times that I don't have my common.py set up like that. I think it's a lot easier to print that. It's human readable. Uh, and then the last one here that I took away is actually one that I had been using somewhat heavily, uh, SMTP lib, which is the way to send an email. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, the weird thing is, is it works in conjunction with another library called email. You import email to actually construct the like the, the body and the headers of the email message. And then you use SMTP lib to actually communicate with the SMTP server to send it out. For, for anyone who hasn't used it before, it is a little bit esoteric. But as soon as you kind of understand and piece together how an email is actually set up, this makes a, a whole lot of sense that you use one library to actually construct the message and then the other 
to to send it out. What I do typically is uh, construct it and then don't send it out, but p print it so I can debug and make sure it's all right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, and and a combination of those two just make it really easy. Uh, I was really happy to come across this article and and kind of dive in and expose myself to more things uh, than I had before. Just trying to branch out there. Do we want to jump into community items and news items here? Sure, absolutely. Uh, I, I do have the first one here to, to breeze through really quick. Uh, Jekyll 4.2 was released. It is probably going to mean that we will start to default to 4.1, which 4.1.1 is their latest in that line. Uh, I don't have any comments other than I did not know that Jekyll Doctor was actually a thing. I, I didn't know either. So you just mentioned it. What does it do? Fix uh, diagnostics? The doctor command checks your site for URL conflicts, errors with your permalinks, and deprecation warnings. This can be especially useful if you've moved pages around or reorganized your site. Sure. Okay. Okay. I will take a look at that and see what we can do. What's that to test out uh, functionality of that Jekyll doctor to make sure pages exist? Mostly for depre for the deprecation warning functionality. Okay. Uh, but that's Jekyll. Uh, and then we got a lot more here, so I'm just going to keep hiring on. Definitely. So we got several different NextCloud updates, uh, uh, two of them, in fact. Uh, one is that there is now uh, easy migration to NextCloud from insecure and privacy unfriendly platforms. And by that, they mean Google. I saw that. I'm excited about that. Yeah, I, they, they have some really good tools. They got uh, for Google, Dropbox, OneDrive, and OwnCloud. Presumably, this would handle uh, all the manual effort and conflicts and, and, and different idiosyncrasies that you would have to otherwise put up with and, and, and work around. So i um, excited to see this. If there is someone who, who is, is thinking of switching over, right, and, and letting us host a, a NextCloud instance for them, if the only thing that's preventing you is, hey, I got all my stuff in Google or all my stuff in, in Dropbox, now there are, are upstream programs to handle that for you. That should not be a barrier to entry anymore. Right. Uh, so so come on over and, and we'd be happy to host your NextCloud instance for you. Uh, totally. and, and a really cool thing that NextCloud has done, uh, and, and this kind of speaks to where Jack and I would like to, to take some of the functionality of what we have in the product here, is that Sales Agility and NextCloud paired up to announce a sweet CRM integration collaboration. Sweet CRM is one of the leading open source CRM providers out there to, to manage customer relations. This would be a great thing to have, especially if Sweet CRM would be one of the services that, that we might provide. At least I know there's a precedence for those two to work together. Yeah, that NextCloud is really becoming the one stop shop, honestly. That's what they just keep adding, you know, features and tools in there that are absolutely useful so we'll see where they go with it i hope it turns out well cool yeah so so definitely more and more good things coming to next cloud i'd love to see it and uh, i i just keep hoping they they continue this forward momentum wordpress updates uh we, there are several here uh notably wordpress 5.6 simone tons of little improvements uh, layout flexibility block patterns video captioning all good stuff, and it, 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 it just speaks to the level of, of feedback that they get and the way that they're able to prioritize. Yeah, I would say about two th a third of that post is a uh, list of contributors that they have. Um, and, and they've also spun out something else that I found interesting, which is their Learn WordPress setup, which Learn WordPress is a way for you to, guess what, learn about WordPress. <laughs> uh, this this uh, offers workshops, discussion groups, lesson plans, and courses. This is part of content marketing. I mean, this is exactly what we were talking about in the in the in the previous episode. I mean, this is how you get people engaged. This is absolutely how you reach out into the community that you've that you built and say, "Hey, we have an opportunity for everyone to come together and either either build this system or market the system out to to people who are interested in learning more about it." Which I think would even be a good segue into our uh Solar Winds breach. The uh big thing that was taken away from that solar breach was the uh supply chain attack 
solar winds orion i think is the product that was uh breached recently i think some bad code got in the code base and it wasn't vetted it wasn't lo- it sounded like it wasn't looked over and it was making malicious calls to send metadata i think this was unrelated uh honestly i the password strength but i know they did have a password out there that was solar ones one two three now that it's easy I, i'll sit here and tell you it's very easy to uh just make a password you know password or you know secret or whatever you know whatever the top 10 are you know your dog's name plus whatever uh but bitwarden <laughs> there's no doubt there are tools out there that j- help you generate passwords and i know they're a pain to type in but they keep you secure yeah and that's why copy paste exists yeah honestly just not 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 great anyone who's using password as their password please change it yeah yeah you, you don't use the same password to log into your bank that you put on your luggage i mean there, there's there's right. two different threat models there to take into account and also you, you know we, we we stress a bit war and, and that's because we both believe in it but yeah. honestly if you go back to the episode we, we were talking about big warden in there was a link to a wiki wikipedia page uh, about the most popular passwords yeah right if you see any of those and you're using anything similar to them, please stop <laughs> and reevaluate how you manage passwords. If you're using more than one password on any given service, please stop and reevaluate <laughs> how you manage passwords. You said it though. You got the clipboard for a reason. It's there for a reason. Use use that by all means. And then you know, the 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 point I'd wrap that up on uh, is. The open source bit of it and SolarWinds actually quite publicly uh, previously had come out uh, saying that open source software was untrustworthy. Word for word, that's kind of what they said. Yeah, it was it was untrustworthy and insecure because anyone could infect it with malicious code. And that's obviously true of closed source software, too. Right. (laughs) Case in point. Right. So so if if your entire argument hinges on that, you've already would made your bed so now lie in it <laughs> i mean at, at at this point we know that all of the software that is sweeping the industry is open source all this this docker and kubernetes stuff you know how many web servers are either nginx or apache right all open say. source you know you you look at anything online that is is battle tested and has been out in there in the community for a while that is all open source any server really that's even running a shell even a lot of the windows ones are open source now so i mean the security that you're trusting on a server regardless of how you're running it is going to be influenced by open source at some point or another and if your entire opinion on open source software is that it is is vulnerable because anyone can put code in it i i I can't understand how you are not in fear for your digital life (laughs) 24 7 this stuff runs everywhere (laughs) If you're not going to embrace it, man, get out of the industry. Go go become say. like a, a bean farmer or something. <laughs> this is just not the mindset to have in 2020. It wasn't the mindset to have in 1990, but it took a while for people to get to that to point. change, right, right. Yeah. And and if if you're not if you're not all about the change, man, you are not long for this industry. You know, Eric S. Raymond uh, had a had a really good quote. He famously said, "Given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow." Meaning you're not going to have ginormous breaches in security like having an, an incredibly insecure password or a, a wide open backdoor in your product. If you have enough eyeballs working on the thing, right? If you have, how many Word, WordPress has like some several hundred, right? <laughs> yeah. Given enough eyeballs on the code, these, these, these actual problems that crop up are going to be easily fixable and quote unquote shallow. I see you have another news item here. How long can a company thrive just doing one thing? I'm going to I'm going to skip to the conclusion and then we can start to pick the details yeah. apart here. The rise of best of breed applications has been of great value to all of us, especially this year, as the world has faced upheaval in how we communicate and work. Without Slack and Zoom, we would not know how valuable it would be to have strong chat and video conferencing tools in our daily lives. The applications that previously dominated these categories, many of which existed in integrated bundles, never innovated enough to really demonstrate what was possible. In that sense, we are rooting for future best-of-breed entrepreneurs to keep pushing the frontier in these and other categories. 
These entrepreneurs make us all better off. But as revealed by the Slack and Salesforce announcement, sometimes the best of breed needs to be absorbed into an integrated bundle. So I know we just came off of a couple of articles uh, talking about Nextcloud uh, integrating stuff into their bundle, right? And Andy Wu, the author of this article, makes the argument here of two things, really. Uh, one, in that we need an integrated stack, an integrated bundle to sell to to people in order for them to be productive. Right. They, people, people need different tools for different tasks. But he also argues that best of breed entrepreneurs, right? So like a, a really good chat client like Slack um, needed to be innovated outside of that bundle before it was acquired and brought in. For those who haven't seen the news, Salesforce acquired Slack for $27.7 billion, right? And PagerDuty okay. recently in, in September had acquired Rundeck for 100 million right so run deck being an automation platform something that we provide as a service that is still open source and slack that wasn't necessarily open source but had a lot of projects open source projects that that used it frequently was acquired by salesforce a a larger bundle company yeah you need those best in breed applications and then you do need a stack for them all to come together slack is I don't remember where I saw this, but someone said it was the Zoom of 2017. Everyone just started piling on. I mean, that, that it was the kind of adoption that only was matched this year with, with Zoom's uh, acquisition of, of all these customers due to the pandemic. They had this, you know, small momentum. And then for some reason, everything just took off. Yeah. Went their way. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and having that and, and being able to constantly refine their process and stuff. The, the weird thing is that they ended up not making it through on their own. They ended up becoming part of something bigger than themselves. And, you know, what's the, what's the deal behind that? Like, what's the rationality behind that? I'd say the integration, honestly. I don't know what, you, what your opinions are on it, but, you know. Maybe they said, all right, we can do chat very well, but you know, I don't, we don't think this is sustainable, but they probably said, <laughs> Hey, let's, let's just become part of a CRM suite rather than take on the CRM suite. Absolutely. And, and there are a couple of ways to break that down between the best of breed strategy and the integrated bundle strategy, right? So if we take a look at the integrated bundle strategy, the highlights are higher pricing, efficiency in go-to-market sales driving value through integration especially he called out the efficiency in go-to-market sales right he said this is a major weakness of slack its sales efforts could never be as efficient as the massive and experienced microsoft enterprise salesforce microsoft has so many tendrils in so many companies right you, you they they just have connections that they don't even know what to do with that are just hanging out there <laughs> so this is something that that slack could only have tapped into by merging itself into a, a larger product, in, in this case, Salesforce. And Salesforce is that integrated tool stack. I mean, I don't know if you've experienced Salesforce at all. I, I've Apparently, it's the end-all, be-all. Like, if you talk to anyone that works in it, they say they love it because I guess you can do everything from within Salesforce. I look at Slack and I see it as, you know, this, you know, best-in-breed chat. It's just that single application. You can't really become the, you know, integration platform with chat, you know, all you can do is kind of rope in more chat. I don't, I don't know how you're going to add in all the all these extra other features that you know a whole CRM has if you're best in breed at chat. You know, if you're only good at chat, it needs some kind of organizational power behind it to to reach out and say, hey, let's work with you guys, right? And and then have that. Obviously, the open source community is really good at doing that just for their own needs, and they kind of manage to bundle together this inner working dependency of applications themselves it's, it's going to be either someone's had this problem and fix it or not one of the other interesting things i saw here was the uh, the higher pricing what economists refer to as price discrimination by bundling it up you can let the customers kind of determine their own value and they're going to say I'm, i may not get as much value from x as i do y right as long as i have both of them at a reasonable price point i'm okay paying that 
right? Because I'm going to, I'm going to make that trade off for myself internally. I don't have to go to two different places and, and negotiate that price. So that, that brings in more business at a, a more efficient price. So uh, interesting that I, I hadn't thought of that. And once again, I love economics, but I, I am not sure I've ever heard of price discrimination before. And that's a, that's a really good thing to understand, I think, especially in this context and especially in the context of, of what we do. Right, right. I'll just throw out manager. You know, we, we already deprecated it, but I don't need manager as much as I need Bitwarden. I don't need manager as much as I need NextCloud. But in the bundle, you know, you get all three and you, maybe you use manager once or twice and you say, okay, it's providing only some utility for us, but Bitwarden and uh, NextCloud are just providing three, four, five, six times more than what manager is. But you bought it as a bundle, but, you know, maybe it's not providing as much as some of the other services that are in that same bundle. Yeah. If, if you got an open slot, if you're like, hey, I can I can add something else in here, might as well try something that otherwise I would not have. Right. Probably not great to use manager and use products that we're no longer shipping, but <laughs> it's out there. Yeah. <laughs> and then that, the, the last point that he brought up here that I did touch on, but I wanted to dive in a little bit more uh, driving value through integration. Right. And, and that is, uh, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to go ahead and read what he has here. Cause I think it's a great example. So he says in theory, complementary applications can create more value when they're integrated. Remember there are two key stakeholder types for a given enterprise customer the end user, and the high-level executive. As end users, we may appreciate being able to directly edit Excel graphs in PowerPoint so we don't have to switch between applications. But for modern CTOs who manage dozens of services, and really, who doesn't, even in your personal life, the value of integration comes from being able to just go to a single vendor when anything goes wrong. Right. Rather than having, you know, eight, 10, 12, you know, however many vendors out there and just, you just can point to one guy or one team and say, Hey, you support all our software, fix it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's much, much easier to do that when you say, Hey, something's, something's broken, you know, and, and, you and look, I, or, right? or I need to have something restored, right? You're, you're, you're going in there, you're, you're managing backups for someone and, and that is a lot easier to, to go to someone to do than to have to do yourself. So uh, that being a service we provide, we also provide integrations, which we, we have in the form of runners, which would be uh, between different products that we offer, scripting, integrating in, in, in any way, uh, interactions between the two of those. Um, so we, we would offer a service to... Uh, tie in some kind of functionality between, say, Camboard and Nextcloud or uh, Nextcloud and Bitwarden. Whatever you're looking to accomplish, we can sit down and have a chat and say, hey, you want to use both of these services in this way. You're going to get a lot of value from integrating the two of them and coming to us to do so. Like that's that's right. what we're here for. Uh, we, we know these products. We know how they work. And, and we are happy to see them work together. They do work together. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and working together, you know, under the umbrella that is our Compose Suite is going to be a lot easier than doing something separately, whether it's, you know, some other password manager service or some other uh, Canboard replacement, right? It's it's going to be a lot easier to get them to work together using something that we already know is able to talk to each other. It's, it's there to make your life easier, right? And, and as he points out, this is, this is the end user approach. I mean, this is, this is being able to directly edit Excel graphs in PowerPoint, right? And, and we're offering a, a, a similar pitch and we're saying, Hey, we're going to be being able to manage stuff from, from one place through one vendor. I mean, that's, that makes it easy. There's a, there's a piece of mind that comes along with that and saying, Hey, this is easy. This works. And then this is easy. Yeah, you want to jump into uh, our Compose developments this week? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I had one that was notable this week, at least. Uh, we randomized the backup times of, of instances. Previously, they were all done at uh, 4.20 in the morning. We wanted to make sure that it wasn't something that we would 
cause anything to be overloaded by, you know, it, as, as we look to scale up, you know, we don't want overlapping issues, right? So we would, we would rather have something that's going to be randomized across a long period of time rather than a specific time. So we have early morning backups uh, running and obviously that's customizable as well per instance. I mean, it's just, that's our default right now. And, and that's something that can be set differently uh, if need be. So very excited to see that. Uh, it, it just makes things easier on all the networks that we have to traverse. Yeah, who would have thought writing, you know, 100 gigs or 150 gigs across uh, a network, a 425 meg network would be uh, <laughs> so demanding. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> so that's me done. Well, no, I got I got one more section. I, I got to. That I get to run through. Actually, this is gonna be this is gonna be fun. But before we get there, uh, I want Jack to take us on a journey into his everyday usage of Canboard. All right, yeah. Every day I do check Canboard. I look at it every day. I have my th- we'll just call it three instances. At work, we do use Jira. I have a personal instance of Canboard set up, and then we have our R Compose instance of Canboard set up. All three are managed just a little bit differently in how they operate, but at the end of the day, I can look to Camboard and say, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm going to do next. And I don't know if it's the title that I really like of what's best next, but honestly, I just keep (laughs) going back to it just because it's so easy to reference and be like, oh, what's best next? And it's a good little phrase I say in my head, like, what's best next? And that's like, oh, let me just check my Camboard and go back to my Camboard here and, you know, see what is best for me to do next. Walk us, walk us through that. So, I mean, what does it, what does it look like? I have to ask myself, well, am I constrained for time? Mm. Because I, I do complexitize my tasks at work and on our, our composed board. Now, for my personal board, I most of them are just lingering like, hey, you know, this might take six hours. This might take two minutes. It's just like a general placeholder for, hey, you should do this and get around to it. But it's kind of like a loose, like, you know, fle- pretty flexible type thing. Now, work in the Archipose board, I absolutely do based on complexity. I check out, I say, hey, I have a half hour before lunch. What can I complete in a half hour that's going to be easy? That's something I can just knock out and, you know, move over to the dunk calm. Or, you know, what do I have an afternoon to take care of? Or what do I have an evening to look at and just block out everything and, you know, take time on, you know, an, an eight or a 13 task. So I really use complexity in the two, I guess, more professional environment of Camboard. And then my personal and I already kind of talked on it, but I have this, uh, it's not notes because it's items I need to take care of and track and do. And I have, uh, I manage them through the columns and they're in different swim lanes, but it's a much looser structure, I would say, than R Compose or Jira at work. It's kind of like a, hey, you should probably get around to this, but if you don't, or when you can type thing, like a I don't want to say I treat it like a to-do list because there's no organization or structure what in the to-do list. I would say that it's a step up from the to-do list, right? And, and it's a step down from a like, collaborative Kanban instance uh, yeah, because sure. I, I, I do the same thing. I have, I have my own personal board for myself. I find that a lot of the stuff there, it's not necessarily that it's unstructured, but that it lingers. Uh, sure, and and right, it's a lot right. more nebulous, the descriptions... I don't have to let anyone else know what I'm working on. Kind of your own brain. You know, it's, it's like uh, yeah. it's there for me. It's not, you know, no one else has to pick this up and say, all right, well, I'm reviewing this, but what does this mean when it's done? That's exactly why I use it too, because at that point, then I'm able to be in the moment way more. Because if, if I'm able to dump the context of my brain out somewhere and just say, okay, let me just, let me put it somewhere else, right? I'm able to forget about it actually for right. a moment. That's what it is, yeah. And put all of my focus into one thing. Yeah. What's best next? Yeah. Yeah. I do want to dive into project scope, but my backlog, it's a laundry list of items and stuff to do. Some of the stuff is important that I, I do separate it kind of based on criticality. I'll take my music board, for example. It's default swim lane, which is like actually physically go out and buy an instrument or buy new strings. Like, you know, literally you need to do this versus I have a swim lane for theory. It's like, well, you know, if you're going to get better at music, you should probably know the theory behind it. All right, just put everything in our theory tab, which could be a category, but don't get me started on that. And then I have <laughs> my, it's called uh, songs is my other swim lane that I have. Any song that I'm working on learning or I want to learn, 
this is where you kind of get in the problems because the category I set for my music board is uh, piano and guitar. So I have a, okay. a keyboard. I have like a, a keyboard. I think it's it's smaller than the standard keyboard, but I have it there. So on my music board, I have you know my default lane, whatever. That's just pick up strings, tune X, Y, Z, whatever. Theory, I'll categorize it because it's easier on the piano to learn theory. So I'll have a task, you know, learn circle of fists. It's like okay, well. For me, a circle fist is pretty easy to pick up on a guitar. I don't know why it is. So I'll categorize it. I'll just toss it under guitar. But, you know, some of the other M's like chord structure, it's like, oh, well, I do need to learn this for piano. So why don't we just say it's for piano? It's way more structured than if I just had, a, like you said, a to-do list that said, you know, I had songs intermixed with theory, intermixed with pickup strings. I look at the to-do list and I have no idea where to start. Coming from a, a background where I love to, to break down boards, there's I think there's a reason why I want to do that. And, and, and I see I see the reason and rationale behind each of those three swim lanes. Right. Right. Uh, because if, if we think about we want to manage the volume of work that goes across our board. We're going to manage them in different struts. You're going to have songs up. Let's just call it up at the top, right? Yeah. So we're going to, we're going to have songs up there because songs is going to be something that we, we don't want to have too many overlapping songs at once, right? Right. But if we overlap uh, learning a new song with getting a set of strings, that's not going to interfere with each other at all. Right. Those are two independent things, right? So in order to limit your work, you would want to limit it in, in one of those three columns, or at least that's what you've identified, right? Right. And that works well enough for you, right? You're limiting your work as it applies to each of those three sections. Right. That's absolutely true. So this is where it gets crazy though for me with the personal board is that I have I have about six projects going in my personal board that vary from, you know, meta to yeah, you know, all the stuff I want to do for the home lab, all the stuff I want to do for music, keeping up with all the coding stuff and Ruby and Python and everything. It's very easy for me, and this is a flaw, it's very easy to just drag stuff over into planned or work in progress and then say, All right, I'm working on all this. Cause I have let's just say six projects. There's no way I'm going to be able to sit down and point at 30 items for myself in progress across six boards. So the really nice thing I like about Camboard is that it provides that dashboard. I think you, you talked about it last week of it just that basic dashboard view that you have. And thank goodness they put in number of tasks in backlog, number of tasks in plan, number of tasks in progress, and number of tasks done. And that's just a basic setup you're able to see what's in backlog, what's in done, and then what's in the middle there. And that's been immensely helpful for me. I, I do kind of put a, a work in progress limit on myself because there's no, there's just no way you can just navigate all the tasks that are out there across, you know, six boards. Since I don't complexitize the stuff on the personal board, it's a long lead time. I, sometimes I just don't get around to it and stuff sits out there. Well, okay. So, so jumping off that though, you said it's a temptation for you to just throw stuff into planning and say, yeah, this is something I'm going to work on. Well, I will throw, I'll keep it, I'll throw it in backlog. So plan for me is, uh, it's not work in progress, but it's like, uh, this is next. You might not like it, but I would call it a prioritized backlog. <laughs> it's the prioritized backlog. I look at it and I say, all right, well, this is what I have planned. Look, I got so much stuff I want to do in the backlog, but no, I'm focusing on what I put in here. So, and, and this is why when we were going over cam board the first time, I think we said we have a Kanban system that has a little bit of sprint to it. Yeah. Yeah. Because the, the way we function is that we, we take a holistic view of the entire board once every two weeks or so and say, okay, did, did we complete stuff? You know, or, right. uh, do we have something that's been on there for three weeks or four weeks? Right. Uh, we, we make sure to capture that time in there, but we don't erase the entire board. Right. Where, where, where is that would force you to prioritize the backlog because then everything gets pushed back that hasn't been completed, you know, and it also has other drawbacks in, in that, you know, there's, there's less that you can actually get done because sometimes you're just waiting on stuff. Then you have One. nothing on deck. You can't right, pull right. anything because you're in the middle of a sprint. Kanban methodology being that more so of a flow state, you're able to prioritize a backlog. But that, you know, you, you touch on it. It's it's hard to prioritize stuff from the backlog to, to planning. I like the way you said it's the hybrid between sprint planning. What do you want to call it? Scrum or sprint versus a, a Kanban methodology. Yeah. 
I really like that you said, I don't have to sit down in two weeks and say, all right, everything's going back to backlog that wasn't completed and let's restart this process. It's, well, this is in waiting. So I can just kind of leave my board in kind of this state for right now. It's fine. I can come back to it, pick it, pick it all back up where I left it off and start, you know, moving items and reprioritizing if I have to. That's a solid way of reprioritizing, but it also means you have to take literally everything into account from your backlog. And, and as you said yourself, I mean, you have plenty of stuff there. Right. I think we have like hundreds, yeah. maybe. Yeah. We may yeah. have it. We have at least a hundred in oh, the backlog. Yeah. It's like, you know, what, what, what do you do about that? And something that I've been uh, tumbling into, and one of the things I found is helpful is when creating a task to definitely associate it with some kind of a category. I think we switch the context to collab, like our compose for us. Sure. I think with a personal board, it's very easy because it's just one, you know, it's one brain working on this. It's very easy yep. to say to yourself, yep. Oh, I know what this means when it's done. I, you know, I, I have one out there that says evaluate cu cube spray. I have literally evaluate the question mark and then cube spray. If someone picked that up, that wasn't me. They would probably say, what are you talking about? But the way we have it at our Compose is we have a definition for done, which I really yes. like. You can grab it and you can say, yes. all right, this is done when this happens. Yes. Yeah, and it's it's immensely helpful to do that. It's immensely helpful because at, at that point, if you have something that you need me to review, obviously my very first question is, all right, does it meet the criteria of done? If right. not, it immediately goes right, back in right, execution. Right. It's like, hey, you need to look at this. Uh, and if it does, we can we can go into other things. But uh, that's that's obviously a really great thing to have as far as collaboration sake goes. Um, the other thing that that I kind of wanted to segue into was uh, categorization, right? So in in managing backlog, obviously there's going to be things that need to be prioritized over other things and 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 moved here and there. Uh, I've had this idea of categories being almost like the different kind of hats you wear, yeah, uh, right. In in the business, there's also another way to take categories, um, or or you can do the same thing with tags or or what have you. But uh, you you can you can categorize things by the project that they're in and, and projects are obviously yeah. a little bit different than tasks because projects are, are, are a bigger picture and presumably a thing that has an end date that is made up of several tasks. Uh, then I can simply focus on the things within this project to prioritize and right. I can limit my backlog by the project that has been prioritized. And it's a way to abstract tasks and then at that point, you're not prioritizing my task, which tends to get very personal because it's it's something that you're you're putting your pouring stuff into. Whereas right. a project is going to be way more collaborative. Right. There's a lot of back and forth with the project. Yeah, there's there's a lot of back and forth and we can each kind of agree what the priority of that project is as opposed to other projects and then be able to sort a backlog based on the project that it's currently in, not on the very specific task that it happens to be. Right. And I think the great example of that would be uh, a lot of what we did with Portal when we were first starting, only because it had to make calls to Run Deck. You know, so it was a project. I don't, I don't know what we called it. I think we used tags, not categories for it, but it was still nonetheless same, same thing, same exact thing you're talking about. It was, uh, hey, we need to get Portal 1 off the ground. We need uh, this portion in Run Deck completed, and we need this stuff in, uh, you know, in Ruby code, in actual Portal to make calls. Well, that's you and me both collaborating on this because we both need our separate parts completed and worked on. So we tagged it and then we prioritized it to get it out the door because we knew that was something we needed before we got to the first instance or, you know, minimum viable product for Portal. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so that, you know, being an example of how, you know, based on the project itself that we had to get completed, you know, that project was the thing that prioritized it. It wasn't, Hey, you know, Jack wants to work in his Ruby code, so I'm going to let him do his thing. And then I'm not going to do my end of it until, you know, the next whenever, right. Until I feel like it. Right. It's not that it's like, right. well, no, we've, we both agreed that we're going to prioritize this project. And in order to do that, that means that these things out of the backlog need to be brought up and prioritized right. themselves. Um, so I don't know, project led backlog prioritization <laughs> as a forward <laughs> definition. I don't know. That's a lot of words right there. <laughs> <laughs> the perfect segue is that you were talking about projects and for us, we did use tags. So there, there, I was going to go th over just a couple search, uh, items that I've used. So I, I think by default, Cambord shows all open tasks. 
but there have been times where we've made extensive notes in tasks and we've had to go back and I've said, all right, well, I know this is out there somewhere and Canmore provides actually a really good search. What, what I've done is I've wiped away open. I've cleared the, uh, you know, filter by open task and I've just searched and said, all right, let me find anything with the word in it and it'll show everything in that done column because i you know it's in it's going to be in done because we've already completed it it's already it's a, a task from the past pulled it up and said all right this is the comment i needed to reference and they have a nice linking method for comments so you can link to the exact comment in the task and you can say hey this is actually where we found you know this piece of information or where we need this information so I, I don't know if it's the perfect note-taking place but I, those comments are valuable like it, I, w- I would almost call it a knowledge base in those uh comments because there is a lot of back and forth during the review process and you know when we go over certain you know skillshare courses or code review it's hey the snippet is in here check it out this is what it's supposed to do based on what i what i've commented it's not searchable by comments right it doesn't make for a good documentation base for which we have Bookstack because right, that, right. yeah, that, is, that, that does the documentation. The yeah. documentation right. um, now, another thing too, uh, I don't know if you played around with the list view at all, but that absolutely lends itself to the searching as opposed to the, the board view. No, I have not done that one. So it's, it's just a list view as you would see in the dashboard. It's, okay. it's the same kind of list yeah. view. Yeah. But if you're going to, be searching for keywords and it's just a list. It's a lot easier to ingest, especially when you're searching, especially stuff that we already know is going to be done. That way I don't have to like open up the done column because usually I got that, you know, minimized and that's just another, you know, hassle for me to open that search, close it. So uh, the, the list view I think does a really good job at, at displaying that. Yeah. uh, I mean the other, I was just going to cover, you know, one or two more things here, but um. Uh, searching by assignee is helpful just to track, you know, especially for me, I just like to see what's mine, um, being all selfish, but, uh, finding out what's mine, uh, searching by tag and searching, uh, based on, you know, a a keyword that's out there. Uh, other than that, you mentioned something that I did want to touch on that I think is important, minimizing backlog, minimizing done Mm, and and mm -hmm. only showing what's right in front of you and that you need to complete today. You know, there's a time and a place to prioritize. We do it every week, which is perfect. Minimizing those two columns, you're not sitting there and, you know, peeking over your backlog saying, all right, well, what can I be, what, you know, what do I feel like working on today? You're you're falling prey to the same old to-do list right. pitfalls. And that's what it is. If, if you have your entire backlog right there and you're just saying, all right, well, what am I going to pull over? You're only cheating yourself at that point. You, you do have to kind of commit to, all right, I, I said I was going to do this. This is what's next. That's everything I have for everyday usage the everyday usage is a little bit opinionated uh so book stack we're gonna have uh, more information out there on our opinions so i would highly recommend checking that out what do you have today for us in uh grab bag i saw the uh title and i'm excited for it i'm wondering if i haven't bitten off more than i could Uh-oh. chew here, but <laughs> i'm i'm willing to take a swing at this and and obviously this is going to be an ongoing thing. What I would like to do here is to create an elevator pitch about Bitcoin fundamentals. So let me just get this clear, let's clarify this. Someone comes up to you and says, Andrew, can you explain Bitcoin to me? Are you going to give them, is this the two minute pitch on that? Well, no, because if someone comes up and, and says, hey, Andrew, can you explain Bitcoin to me? Then I, I've got I've got so many different things I need to go through, right? So okay. like the technical part of things, uh, which is what we're going to, touch on today and as well i have marked down here other areas for discussion i have economic and societal right so like like what's its impact on uh, economics and and the society uh, in 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 broad terms right um how how do you describe it as money so how how is it money and how can it be used as money and you know currency trading and and all this other things you know the history of gold um going through that um, and, and also, you know, a, a history itself, a history of Bitcoin. So, like, where did it get started? Who is Satoshi? Um, who bought the first pizza? You know, the, the different things yeah, yeah, about yeah. Bitcoin that, that all come together to make up, you know, what is Bitcoin, right? Um, and, and I think it was, it was really crazy. So, after I had this idea, my roommate came up to me and he's like, so, Andrew. I was like, oh, okay. He's like, so... 
so Bitcoin. I'm like, oh, okay. It's like, how does it actually work? And I'm like, oh, okay. This is something I could speak yeah. to. Yeah. And first of all, I have a couple sources here as to where I got a lot of my information. So the first one was the Bitcoin white paper, obviously. The very first place to go. That's a great place to start, I'd say. <laughs> it's, let's start at the very beginning. <laughs> yes, exactly. So it's very readable. It is eight pages long from introduction to conclusion. I think he does a really good job of going over what needs to happen and and really way better than I could in any kind of elevator pitch, right? He, he does it right here in this white paper. I think we're going to start there. Next is uh, Bitcoin, a technical introduction. This was a talk given by a Mozilla employee. It was just a very, very good speech. The audio is horrendous. It, it, it is just the worst. But if you can right. make out what he says, he does also have his slides available publicly with his own personal notes on them. I've used those as a reference before. Uh, it's, it's just a very good overview of a lot of the problems that Bitcoin was introduced to solve. And the other one is from the late, great Aaron Schwartz, a blog post where he was talking about squaring Zuko's triangle. Um, Zuko's triangle postulating that it's impossible to have secure, decentralized, as well as human-readable namespace. He had this epiphany or, or moment of clarity or what, what do you want to call it, where he was able to work through how Bitcoin would, would solve something like that, yeah. uh, actually ending up in Namecoin. But I think he has the best kind of description of how Bitcoin actually works that people are very easily able to visualize. Okay. So I think I think that's the thing I really took away from him. He, he does describe it in a very approachable manner. And, and then he goes into all different kinds of implications, which are great as well. I'm going to start off reading the abstract to the white paper. It begins thusly. A purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. Digital signatures provide part of the solution, but the main benefits are lost if a trusted third party is still required to prevent double spending. We propose a solution to the double spending problem using a peer-to-peer -peer network. The network timestamps transactions by hashing them into an ongoing chain of hash-based proof-of-work, forming a record that cannot be changed without redoing the proof-of-work. The longest chain not only serves as proof of the sequence of events witnessed, but proof that it came from the largest pool of CPU power. As long as a majority of CPU power is controlled by nodes that are not cooperating to attack the network, they will generate the longest chain and outpace attackers. The network itself requires minimal structure. Messages are broadcast on a best effort basis, and nodes can leave and rejoin the network at will, accepting the longest proof-of-work chain as proof of what happened while they were gone. Honestly, when you read it aloud, to me that just makes sense have to break it down for someone who isn't technical let's break it down here because i am coming up with this with you today this is not something i've put together <laughs> i've gathered all the resources and i'm trying to make sense of them myself and the best way to think through a solution is to actually talk through it right I, that's that's what i wanted to do today to see if we can get anywhere where i started was actually at the the hash function but in retrospect i wanted to start it a little bit earlier as far as what is what is a transaction even? So when I send a transaction, obviously there's two parties, Jack and I, and we have to send a transfer of wealth between us. Uh, how, how do we do that without a third party? I can obviously give him cash or give him gold, uh, but if I want to do it with Bitcoin, what is actually going on under the hood? Each Bitcoin client, and usually that's going to be a app on your phone, go figure, is going to have multiple wallet addresses. And these are, these are just very long numbers that you hold the private keys for, that you can verify cryptographically that you own and operate, and that are unique. So all right, what, what do you do at that point if, if Jack says, I have this, this wallet, right? Um, here's, here's my wallet address, and he, it's usually going to be a QR code, or if he sent it to me on the, the desktop, it's going to be a long string that I copy-paste somewhere. What I do is I, I send money to that, that wallet address, and I'm going to say, hey, let me send to that wallet address uh, that your client has come up with that we scan. The other thing is that I don't send it, like literally, I don't send network packets to him. What I do is I... 
get that wallet address. And that wallet address, I broadcast to the network, hey, I want to pay this wallet address so many Bitcoin. Right. right. So then at that point, you got to say, all right, what do we... What are we sending this off to? Uh, what, what does this look like? And, and how does this work? Well, we have to take a step back. So let's, let's keep that transaction in the back of your minds where, where I'm sending a, a transaction to Jack and I broadcast it to the network. So the network operates on what's known as a mempool where all these transactions just kind of hang out until they get confirmed in a block. And, and we'll go into that in a second. But this, this mempool is shared amongst all these Bitcoin miners. And if you haven't heard that term before, there's a different discussion we need to have. But we have, we have Bitcoin miners who are in charge of verifying and creating the blockchain and, and doing all this stuff, right? They're the real workhorse behind what's all going on. And so I send my transaction out there and I say, uh, please include this uh, and, and verify it so that I can verify that my transaction is valid to Jack uh, and, and, and go forward with my day from there. So uh, I, I send it to the mempool and eventually it will make its way onto a block and into the chain. How does that happen? In order to understand blocks, we have to understand hashes. We have right. to say a hash is a one-way function that is deterministic. You can only take a whatever input you want and get a specific output every single time. Uh, it, as long as you have the exact same input, you're going to get the exact same output. It's deterministic. However, given the output, you cannot reverse engineer it to yeah. generate the input. Right. Given, given that we have a hash function, we also have to understand it has one more property. And that hash function also has a property of the output is entirely random based on the input. In that if we're given an input of like 500 different numbers, right? Um, and if we only change one of the numbers that we're, we're putting in there, even just by incrementing at one number, the output is going to be completely different. So it's, it's pseudo random, if not completely random as to what the actual output of that hash function is going to be, right? So we have three properties to this hash function, right? Given a specific input, it will always output the same thing, right? right. It cannot be reverse engineered. Right. And the output is completely randomized given the input, right? So, so if we understand a hash function, the rest of it kind of falls into place, right? So if we, if we take a step back and we say, all right, we need to uh, include this, this transaction from me to Jack uh, into, the, into the blockchain, right? We're ready to do that. I, I broadcast to the network to the miners and say, hey, guys, let's, uh, let's confirm this. And they're like, all right, I'm going to confirm it. How do they confirm it? You know, what, what's the process of, of what is a block? You know, how do you, how do you create a block? Well, uh, a block is an input of, of several different things. Most notably, uh, a list of transactions. So a transaction saying Andrew sent, you know, $10 to Jack. The hash of the previous block, right? So a, a unique identifier of the previous block. And it also has a nonce value, which in cryptographic terms, a nonce is basically a randomized padded number, right? So it's, it's, and it's something that the miners control. The miners can set whatever they want to be this nonce. You know, it's just, it's just a, a number they plug in to change the output. Because if you think about it, if you have the same transactions in a block, right, that's going to all be the same input. The previous block is obviously going to be the same input because that's not changing. The only thing a miner has power to change is this nonce, is this random number. If all we told them to do is, hey, get a hash of that, they can put in any random nonce they want and they can output a hash. And they can say, hey, this is valid because I took the previous block, I took all the transactions in this block, and I took my nonce and I created this hash number. Great, that's awesome. But that's not secure because anyone can do that almost instantaneously. Remember, you will always get an output and you always get the same output. What makes a block unique is that it has a target that it needs to hit for that number. Now, if, if we assume that number is random, right, it's a random chance that it meets the criteria that we need that number to be. So say it's like a 32-bit number, right? Um, one of the constraints that Bitcoin has is that that number, whatever it ends up being, if it doesn't start with a certain number of zeros, then it is invalid, 
right? So if a miner plugs in all the necessary information and then picks a random number one for our rationale and says, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to pick number one. I'm going to put that as a nonce and then they get an output because they hash that block, you know, they hash the, the, the block and the previous block and the nonce and it comes out and it only has four leading zeros instead of five because it's completely random. The miner said, oh, well, I got to I got to try again. So he's going to change the only thing that he has control over, which is the nonce, and he's going to rehash all of that information. Now, these hashes take less than milliseconds. I mean, they, you, you can do just a ridiculous amount of these these hashes in, in a row uh, over time, uh, incrementing these nonces. The second attempt that this miner goes through could come out with a number that has no leading zeros. It could start with the number nine for, for all we know, because it is a completely random number generator. Uh, so, so he's going to keep trying over and over and over again, changing this random number until he randomly finds a number that starts with five zeros. Now I say randomly, that's not quite true. Uh, it's probabilistic that he is going to have several zeros in the beginning of his number. Now, if, if we think of a completely random chance, what's a random chance of you getting a zero in a number? One in 10. One in 10. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Now, if we, if we continue on this path and we say, all right, what's the chance that you get two zeros in a row? One in a hundred. Yeah. It's one tenth of one tenth, which is one one hundredth. As you keep going down, you'll see that this difficulty gets more and more difficult as you keep going uh, and and you can change the parameters too there's there's various ways to kind of tweak this to make it more granular and not take such big leaps but the basic idea is that you have a certain constraint that the hash of the block given the nonce that the miner puts in has to match right or, or you know has to has to conform to and if it doesn't then that's not considered a valid block and you have to go back and try again like i said these miners are trying these calculations billions and billions of times per second so if you if you keep iterating over this the chance that you're going to hit that goes up right what i was going to say is that that's the compute function that it's doing it's saying all right i need to take my nonce my previous block hash and my my current block hash and just basically what you're doing is finding leading zeros yeah yeah, yeah, it, it, to, to put it that simply now. Now, keep in mind, if, if we have that difficulty target, which is what that's called, it's that, you know, the, the, the network talking amongst all these computers, they say, all right, we're only going to accept blocks that meet, the, meet this difficulty target, meet these five leading zeros. When someone does find that, that is pretty much proof that they have put in an average number of calculating power to solve this problem, to meet that difficulty target. The technical term there, as Satoshi had put it, is proof of work. Sure. We can now prove that on average, we have put forth this amount of work into solving this equation. And, and it can be verified that I have spent this much to get to that, to have that hash work out. And, and, and this is set, by the way, this is set uh, on average to about every 10 minutes. Given the computing strength of the network, if the algorithm starts seeing that, oh, you know, is we're getting blocks faster and faster. We, you know, the last 10 of them has been on every eight minutes. You're going to say, oh, okay, someone just threw a whole lot more mining power at the network. So on average, we're finding them faster. So let's increase the difficulty so that we can slow it back down to 10 minutes. So you have the network kind of controlling that one block comes out every 10 minutes. And that's where you get that your average confirmation time for a transaction is about every 10 minutes because that's when your transaction would be put in a block and then published onto the blockchain. Because once you do find that hash, then you publish that. You say, here's the previous hash. Here is the list of transactions. And here's the nonce that I used to meet that difficulty target, right? This is the one that I found after, you know, so many times of trying. And then you server that finds it, broadcasts it to all its peers. And they all verify it because it's really easy to verify. All you got to do is run one of those things that they have been running billions of per second, right? So you verify it almost instantaneously. And then you can start working on the block after that, given its hash. Let's just say that a block gets it's published to the network, right? So it's it's published and then people start working on the next one. Well, at that point, we start to see how all of this work 
builds on itself, right? So each block builds on the previous and, and you keep going and going in perpetuity. Uh, and, and you can go back and, and since everything's published, you can, you can verify everything. There's ways to prune, to save disk space and, and network space. And there was ways to verify that all the transactions that are in the current block were not in the previous block. But let's take a look at those transactions for a second here, going a little bit off script. So those transactions, by the way, are those those transactions are simply transfers uh, in in more of a ledger type system. Obviously, a, as we've gone through this, we've we've talked with the understanding that that Bitcoin is more of a ledger protocol than it is a coin protocol. So instead of like me giving Jack a, a several coins and then coming back to him next week and saying, "Hey, uh, how many coins do you have?" and he he looks down in his hand and he's able to tell me, right? Right. Where alternatively, if I had to ask him how many Bitcoin he has, he would take a look at all the wallet addresses that he controls, and then he would sum up all of the values that have been transferred into and out of those wallet addresses. Going backwards. Going backwards, yes. Right. Yeah. You would end up with a summary and saying this is after all of the additions and subtractions, just like in any other accounting ledger system, here is your total, right? And then you have your total of, uh, across all of your wallets. Given that they're transactions, there exists a thing, the thing of a block reward, right? So obviously we have to, we have to understand, all right, so these, these miners are doing these calculations uh, again and again and again and again and again, right? What motivates them to do this? Like, why are sure. they, why are they doing this? Right. Well, turns out that every time, that you find a new block, that you successfully find a new block with a nonce that matches the difficulty target, then you get to send yourself a number of Bitcoin that did not previously exist. Because if we if we think back to the transaction between Jack and I, that was a transaction that someone had sent, you know, one of my wallets uh, enough Bitcoin for me to, to to make a transaction to for him to receive some of what I had previously received, right? So what this miner gets to do is say, by the way, here's my own wallet address. Um, send 50 Bitcoin to that wallet address from nobody. It's, it's just generated. Now, this is going to be acceptable to all the other miners on the network. They're like, you know what? Yeah, you did find it. You deserve that. Uh, we're going to, we're going to let you have that, that coin base is what it's called. We're, we're going to let you have that coin base as long as it doesn't exceed what they're allowed to spend. Obviously, these miners are all talking with each other and they say, all right, at this point, at this point, you know, it's, it's 50. Anyone can send them themselves up to, you know, 50 Bitcoin. And then, um, later on they're, they're you're dropping it and you're actually doing that programmatically too, which is, which is interesting economically, uh, in the sense that we started out with that coin base being 50 Bitcoins per block. Uh, so, so people were sending themselves 50 Bitcoins. Keep in mind, this is when Bitcoin was worth like half a cent. So this wasn't, this Just, wasn't worth a whole right. lot. So, so we started out with 50. As the network aged, every 210,000 blocks, which is approximately four years, if we think one block is every 10 minutes, the reward was cut in half. The allowable reward was cut in half. So it went from 50 to 25. Then it went from 25 to 12.5 and it will continue having and it'll actually have past the single integer level so so you're gonna you're gonna start having way off in the future and i think it's something like 2140 i think it is year 2140 you're gonna get to the point where you can't have it anymore given that bitcoin goes out to i, I think it's something like eight decimal points right it, it has this function of an asymptotic curve where you are always going to be approaching this 21 million mark of Bitcoin. As, as, as you keep on having it, you're going to get closer and closer and closer there, right? If you, if you stay on this denomination, it's going to be 20,999,999.9769 Bitcoin. Right. That's that's what you're ever going to have unless you make it more granular and get closer and closer and closer to 21 million. But never 
quite 21 million. Once again, I'm not going to get into the societal ramifications here. All I'm okay. saying that all right, all right. is that we're approaching 21 million Bitcoin ever in circulation. Another thing that would incentivize the miners is going to be transaction fees. So uh, if you consider that the miners are free to accept or not accept any transactions that they want into a block, they can actually mine a block with zero transactions in it. And that is perfectly valid for different reasons that we're not going to get into today. You can actually mine a, a block with zero transactions. So you got to say, all right, why would miners include my transaction if they're guaranteed that coin base of, of however many Bitcoin anyways that they, they're appropriating to themselves? Well, transactions can include a transaction fee. Now, this is going to be very similar in practice to what MasterCoin or Visa do by taking 4% off of a transaction uh, through your credit card. They, however, are going to be taking it from the merchant, whereas Bitcoin puts the onus on the customer the person you know who initiating the transaction yeah, yeah. sending the transaction yeah yep to include the transaction fee you're gonna be able to bribe miners there's no other way to put it i mean you're, you're bribing and saying hey you know what i only need to pay jack ten dollars but i'm including ten and a half a penny so if you want to include this transaction that half penny is all yours you know right and, uh, and, and the miners just gobble that up as soon as they find the, the next block. So you have those transaction fees that can be included as an additional reward to the miner in order to incentivize them to include your transaction in addition to the base, the Coinbase reward that they're getting currently. Uh, let me let me hop over to Aaron Schwartz's blog uh, and read how he describes Bitcoin. All right, go ahead. Okay. So Aaron Schwartz puts it like this. Here's how it works. Let there be a document called the scroll. The scroll consists of a series of lines, and each line consists of a tuple, a name, and a key, and a nonce, such that the first bits of the hash of the scroll from the beginning to an end of a line are all zero. As a result, to add a line to the scroll, you need to do enough computation to discover an appropriate nonce that causes the bits of the hash to be zero. And he says, to look up a name, or in this case, a transaction, you ask everyone you know for the scroll, trust whichever scroll is the longest, and then start from the beginning and take the key for the first line with the name you're looking up. To publish a name, you have to find an appropriate nonce and then send the new line to everyone you know. This is the way that you add blocks to the blockchain. You you think about it as a, a scroll, right, or like an interconnected uh, chain of, of links, right? I think either is valid. I, I really like this scroll analogy because it's a way to think of it non-blockchain-y blockchain. It's not a chain. You're not linking anything that, because a chain link, I, I when you say chain link, I immediately just think, oh, it's two pieces of metal connected to one another. The scroll, you at least get the data in there. And he mentioned something that I haven't touched on yet, which is the length of these lines, right? Why would you trust the longest one? Well, we, we know that on average, one line or, or in, in Bitcoin's case, each block, takes 10 minutes to mine. So if you have one that has more blocks than another chain, you want to say, all right, well, your chain is actually shorter than the other chain that I see over here. I'm going to go for the other chain because I know on average, there's been more computational power put into that and I can trust that more. Why can we trust it more? Well, that's a great question. We can trust it more because the blockchain is actually a solution to the Byzantine generals problem. Um, and I have a link here to a great explanation of it by Tim Scott. If you don't know who he is, I'm sorry, you just lost a day in YouTube. So Satoshi actually addressed this in an email, which I thought was just brilliant. He said, a number of Byzantine generals each have a computer and want to attack the king's Wi-Fi by brute forcing the password. Once they stimulate the network to generate a packet, they must crack the password within a limited time to break in and erase the logs, otherwise they'll be discovered and get in trouble. So they gotta coordinate their attack. They only have enough CPU power to crack it fast enough if a majority of them attack at the same time. All we need is a simple majority, we need over 51% right to to be honest and to attack the system all at the same time and they said they don't particularly care when the attack will be just that they all agree it's been decided that anyone who feels like it will announce a time and whatever time is heard first will be the official attack time 
The problem is that the network is not instantaneous, and if two generals announce different attack times at close to the same time, some may hear one first and the others hear the other first, right? Then he goes into how proof of work solves this. Uh, to sum it up, you can rely on the longest chain having the most confirmations and the majority of the hash power. If we've solved this singular problem, right? If we've, if we've hashed this many blocks together, at least this many people had to be dedicating their CPU to working on this one time, right? right? Not the other time. If, if someone propose, proposed another time and they had three blocks in two hours, right? And we had 12, we know that we all were working on the same problem more so than the other problem. Right, right. So the majority of us have agreed that this is the time that we've been working on. It's really easy to break down and say this system that he's creating uh, needs to be tolerant, right? Because it's called a Byzantine fault tolerant system. It needs to be able to resist the class of failures derived from what we've been discussing, right? So if, if you have people misbehaving out there, uh, but it's not the majority of people, you have to derive a system that is tolerant to that. It, it needs to grow and it needs to be able to, to work its way past that. And I think that kind of covers most of what I wanted to say about Bitcoin. So, so given that, what does that elevator pitch look like? We start off, we have to level set and say, Bitcoin is a ledger based system. You said it, ledger system. Where transactions are recorded. I was going to say based off the hash. I was going to say the hash of the previous block, the current block, and the nonce. Can we simplify that at all? <laughs> I mean... In technical terms, it sounds pretty good. <laughs> well, what's what's a hash, right? So we, we talked about hashes. Can we say one-way functions that are deterministic and provide random output given the input of the previous transaction? No. It's going to be hard to break down hash. Yeah. A cryptographic function based off of the solution to a cryptographic function. And just the function is a hash? Yeah. I'm just replacing hash with cryptographic function. Because then at that point you could say, okay, this well, this specific cryptographic function has several different oh, okay, 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 okay. properties, right? Yeah. If 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 you need to dive in there, because then you can start talking about the actual blockchain itself. So each time a solution is found, because we're continuing to generate transactions here, right? Right. So each time a solution is found, that takes into account all the transactions. Time passes, like. Yeah. Well. Yeah. The. The solution is posted publicly, right? Yeah, yeah, I was going to say. The solution is posted publicly for other... For anyone. Okay, okay. For anyone to see. This allows us, the users, to tell if their transaction have been confirmed or not. You could also add in there the uh, whether they've been confirmed or not. Uh, I was going to say something with the 51% thing. Yeah, you can say that there are several different guarantees. Fine, right. So we covered what a transaction is, I guess how it, or when a transaction takes place. So we did how and when do we want to do like the, I guess the why is that we can. The why is that, well, yeah, actually the why is the next sentence. The why says this allows the users to tell if their transactions have been confirmed or not. Okay. Yeah, I like that. And then also as like a part of the why, it's like a secure system. My next sentence is there are several different guarantees because of this system. Okay. We say, we say, all right, what's one of the guarantees? Well, we went over the uh, Byzantine generals problem. So because it requires massive amounts of work from everyone working on the same chain, because it, it requires everyone to be working on the same block. Yeah, right? right. So because it requires that massive amount of work from everyone working on the same thing, uh, same, same problem. What do you want? The I same mean, problem. Yeah. The same. Yeah. The same problem. Yeah. You could call the group of transactions or the block that if you want to call it yeah, that because it requires a massive amount of work from everyone working on the same problem right we can what we can be assured that everyone's agreed on the most recent and up-to-date version you can even call it the transaction ledger everyone agrees on which transactions should be in the ledger do we want to say that we can assume that everyone agrees on which transactions should be in the ledger and which ones should not be yeah i would also include though which ones are in the ledger and which ones should not be in the ledger Mm -hmm. Then we can get into Bitcoin miners. So we can say the, the miners that run this network, the miners that are solving this problem are rewarded. Yeah. 
yep. uh, by being able to both because I don't want to say mint coin because there's a certain connotation attached to that. So is there a better way to say that, that they are literally taking a transaction with no input and generating output and that everyone kind of comes to a consensus on that? Right. Is there a better way to, to say that? For reward? I would just say reward because I know I know exactly the connotation you're talking about with, with a uh, the word coin. So, yeah, because so the miners are that are solving this problem are rewarded. How? What do you want to call? I would even just call it extra output from the transaction. Ooh, I like extra output from mining the transaction from computing well, the transaction from with any extra output from either both any user transactions and a cuz I don't want to say brand new transaction. What do you want to call it a standard reward? Yeah. Default reward. I like standard for solving the problem. This standard reward introduces new not new bitcoin but like this this standard reward introduces new transactions that can be spent to other users you see where i'm going with that and then we can say there are only going to be 21 million ever created so right right so the standard reward introduces new oh not accounting not ledger introduces new entries that's what it is. Entries. Yeah, I like entries. Into the ledger, which can be spent as normal. I want to talk about the 21 million, right? So as a system, the Bitcoin network has agreed that the total rewards ever given out will approach. But never equal. Yeah, but never exceed. 21 million. All right. All right. That's good. That's really good. So read, read it right now. Yeah, give it a... Sure. Sure, sure. Give it a... Once through. All right. <clears throat> Bitcoin is a ledger based system where transactions are recorded based off of the solution to a cryptographic function. Each time a solution is found that takes into account all the transactions, the solution is posted publicly for anyone to see. This allows the users to tell if their transactions have been confirmed or not. There are several different guarantees because of this system. Because it requires a massive amount of work from everyone working on the same problem, we can assume that everyone agrees on which transactions should be in the ledger and which ones shouldn't. The miners that are solving this problem are rewarded with any extra output from both any user transactions and a standard reward for solving the problem. Yeah. This standard reward introduces new entries into the ledger which can be spent as normal as a system the bitcoin network has agreed that the total rewards ever given out will approach but never exceed 21 million so i think that's a lot of what we've covered so far i i wasn't timing that i don't know how long that was but um i, th I think we can wrap it up saying something about how the blockchain is going to continue on into the future I, I think it flows better when you wrap into the previous sentence. So we can say, as the miners continue to... Reap rewards? Yeah. Collect rewards? Yeah, collect rewards. As the miners continue to collect rewards by solving these cryptographic problems, the ledger, also known as the blockchain... Continues to grow? That is exactly, that is exactly what I had in my head. All right, what's what's a uh, very last gut punchy sentence here that we can let me see what Satoshi has. Actually, that's a good thing. Before we conclude it, let me let me read his conclusion. So he says, "We have proposed a system for electronic transactions without relying on trust." That's a huge sell right there. Oh yeah. We started with the usual framework of coins made from digital signatures, which provide strong control of ownership but is incomplete without a way to prevent double spending. To solve this, we proposed a peer-to-peer -peer network using proof of work to record a public history of transactions that quickly becomes computationally impractical for an attacker to change if honest nodes control a majority of CPU power. The network is robust in its unstructured simplicity. Nodes work all at once with little cooperation. They do not need to be identified since messages are not routed to any particular place and only need to be delivered on a best effort basis. Nodes can leave and rejoin the network at will, accepting the proof-of-work chain as proof of what happened while they were gone. They vote with their CPU power, 
expressing their acceptance of valid blocks by working on extending them and rejecting invalid blocks by refusing to work on them. Any needed rules and incentives can be enforced with this consensus mechanism. So two things I want to work on is consensus mechanism and without relying on trust. And I think we can bring it home with that. I was going to say it, it makes it a trustless system. Mm -hmm. We can say by using the system of solving these cryptographic problems, which is the consensus mechanism, the Bitcoin network provides a system for electronic transactions without relying on trust in any third party. I like that. Without relying on trust from a third party. Well, without relying on trust from... Trust, period. Yeah, you could just leave it at trust, honestly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay, so we can say by using this system, the Bitcoin network finds a way to transact electronically without relying on any model of trust. Yeah. All right. Uh, it, I'm going to go ahead and read it back. So you go ahead and time me on this and let me know what we're at. All right, go for it. Bitcoin is a ledger-based system where transactions are recorded based off of the solution to a cryptographic function. Each time a solution is found that takes into account all the transactions, the solution is posted publicly for anyone to see. This allows the users to tell if their transactions have been confirmed or not. There are several guarantees because of this system. Because it requires a massive amount of work from everyone working on the same problem, we can assume that everyone agrees on which transactions should be in the ledger and which ones shouldn't. The miners that are solving these problems are rewarded with any extra output from both any user transactions and a standard reward for solving the problem. This standard reward introduces new entries into the ledger, which can be spent as normal. As a system, the Bitcoin network has agreed that the total rewards ever given out will approach but never exceed 21 million. As the miners continue to collect rewards by solving these cryptographic problems, the ledger, also known as the blockchain, will continue to grow. By using this system, the Bitcoin network provides a way to transact electronically without relying on any model of trust. A minute 21. Oof. It is almost an elevator pitch at that point. I'm going to just get rid of that one sentence that says there are several different guarantees. Yeah, you don't need yeah. that one in there. It's it's kind of just on its own, and I think the next sentence sums up pretty well what the yeah. guarantees are. Yeah, exactly. And I'm pretty good with that. Minute long, minute 15 seconds. I mean, right around an elevator ride. And, you know, I, I think that was a really good exercise in, in kind of walking through that hopefully, you know, for, for you and... And for anyone else who, who is who is listening to, it's it's going to hold a lot more weight uh, because of what we've gone through, uh, and and I think obviously going through that is important, and and adds a a, a whole nother level to to any kind of pitch, um, but especially summation of you know what what Satoshi wrote down, uh, what he meant, uh, and different implications of the system that that came about because of that. And if you believe like we do, that this message needs to be heard. Go to rcomposedcast.com and donate today. All the donations go right back into growing and sharing this show so we can get the, the word out. And with that, we hope you enjoyed this episode of Our Composedcast. Thank you, be safe, and we'll see you all in two weeks. Bye, everybody.